Chapter 16, Conquering the Continent, 1854 to 1890. So we're talking about the Western expansion movement here in the United States uh, as the revolution is over. It begins, but again, the Civil War kind of put it on the back burner for a while, the build up to the Civil War, the Civil War itself. So after the war, you pick up this idea of manifest destiny again. And, you know, for the most part, we, we've learned that this was a noble idea that these settlers came across the land and covered wagons to, to make the land their own. And, of course, there, there's a part of that, that that's truth, but there's also the other side of it. You had to conquer the people that were there. And in some cases, many people would say that that continent was stolen from these Native Americans that, that mostly died from disease, couldn't defend themselves. 500 years of conquest and resistance in the Americas. That's part of the story, too, a counter history that challenges all of our comfortable assumptions. Uh, we, we can't keep looking at just the good parts of history and believing them. we we got to dig for truth. What's the truth? Well, goodness happened for sure. Uh, the Western expansion movement is a, you know, a sacred era in United States history. But at what cost? What happened to the Native Americans, the Hispanics, the Mexicans that were also there before the Europeans, before the American settlers came? So we, we got to see both sides of the story here. So after the Civil War, you know, the country had been shaken to its core, depressed by the war. The buildup to that war had taken up the first half of the 19th century. All this is going on while you're still trying to build this young nation that only gained their independence uh, legally in the 1780s. Uh, what's happening in the world? The, the rest of the, of the world, the, the, the um, uh, industrializing countries were entering the Industrial Revolution and getting into mass production, factories, mechanization, modernization. This was in full swing in Europe, but it kind of took a back seat in the United States because of this war. So it was pretty clear you had to finish this war before you could move on and, and join the rest of the world in, in, in moving towards the future. Uh, so when the war is over, uh, America picks up this idea of expansion. And again, they want more land. We've got to have more land. Uh, so as a country, they set their sights on that. And, and they do this in a couple of ways, uh, looking at the at the blue parts here, Texas, you know, disputed area claimed by Texas and so on. The Texas Revolution in the 1830s uh, wins Texas away from Mexico. That would later become part of the United States. Uh, then you have the Mexican-American War 10 years later, 1846 to 48, uh, a war that I, I mentioned in the introductory lecture was manu a manufactured war to steal that land. So look at all this land from, from Texas to California, it's all gained by the United States in about in about a 12 year or so period. Okay, so of course they they uh, they they're they're filling in the pieces to to finally have this this country from sea to shining sea. Okay, uh, but of course it's it's at a price for the people that that live there. Uh, but moving moving west is what it's all about post Civil War. Uh, this is an image of Daniel Boone looking to the West, going way back to his time. Moving West is what the Americans were all about, land and opportunity. Uh, and after the Civil War, there's a feeling of a new beginning, a fresh start. Many white men in the South had been dispossessed by the war, and they lost everything. Uh, so, so they're looking for new uh, opportunities. African Americans, of course, trying to find their place as freed people now, but in an, in an oppressive South and an unwelcoming North, Native Americans, of course, clinging, you know, with desperation to the hope that the tide would at some point turn for them. And they came up with a dance called the Ghost Dance. And this was inspired partly by Christianity, partly by Native ways. And it was a dance to bring back the bison herds. To, but perhaps more importantly, to, to drive the white man back to the east and across the Atlantic. So you, you, could, you could suggest a desperation here. I mean, they didn't have any, any other chance or hope, so they're, 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 they're trying for anything here. Their, their ways, their way of life is, is, is slipping quickly, and it's nearly gone. Uh, so we'll, we'll pick up the significance of this ghost dance uh, later on in this chapter. Uh, you have white women. Uh, in, in this new United States, they had lost their opportunity to gain the vote when the when the Civil War ended. 
uh, the, the vote was given to freed black men, but not to white women. Of course, so, so they're angry about that. They, they keep on pushing, uh, doing the best they could in a male-dominated society, pushing for equality. They continue to live lives that were shaped by the actions of their husbands. But inside of all this despair, there was hope because the war is over and is a new beginning, fresh start. So people began looking to the West and expansion. The war was over and this, you know, decades-long struggle between North and South had been settled. And we come back to this idea of manifest destiny. Uh, so we mentioned uh, this image before. The, 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 uh, of course, the angel represents America. She's floating across the land. You can't see it, but she's got a telegraph wire uh, hanging from her hands, and it's being strung behind her. She's got books in her hand for, for knowledge and education. Behind her has already been in light. You see it's brighter. And you have the, the you know, commerce and ships on the river trading. You've got stagecoaches and covered wagons, settlers coming, railroads are coming, Pony Express, miners. All, all this is the future, and, and this is good. But who's running and, and who's in the dark on the, on the left side of the image? You see the buffalo herds are running, and the Native Americans are running. Uh, because this this new way is spreading across the land and converting it, and the old ways will be will be done. Uh, from the American settlers' point of view, God had chosen them, these white Christian people, to, to be His favorite to spread across the land and make it their own, and to turn it into a Christian society organized by white supremacy. Uh, the idea was to convert any non-whites and fit them in the best they could. But, of course, they never really had any, any real opportunity to advance. Uh, so by the time of Western expansion, the East, in the East, the Native Americans had been, had been subdued or removed by, removed by this time. But what about in the West? I mean, the, the American settlers hadn't been there yet, so you hadn't had any kind of conflict or any kind of conquering. They were still there, living in the West. Uh, and you know, as as the as the movement comes across the land slowly, you know, the frontier line moves with it. The frontier being the kind of border between these two peoples, uh, land land that had been uh, not uh, changed much in 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 centuries. You know, the Native Americans didn't tear it up, and they didn't see the land as opportunity. They saw it as Mother Earth that that gives you what you need. You know, they 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 didn't believe in private property and and the the land was for everybody. When the but when the Europeans came, uh, the land got torn apart pretty quickly. That had really never happened before. Uh, natives had worshipped it, lived within it. They would never think of tearing it apart. But the Europeans came and they cleared forests. They they tore it down uh, for land to plant with or or land for settlement. They changed the way the land looked. They brought in the plow to loosen the earth and tore it up. They put barbed wire around parcels of land, strip mining, this idea of private property. Uh, the, the natives had no concept of that. So anywhere that the Europeans took hold and, and conquered, it immediately be, began getting torn up, the land. Uh, so, so the white settlers had a dilemma. You know, these people don't integrate with us very well. They're different. They don't, we're not going to find common ground. So, so what do we do to them, with them? How, how do we get rid of them? What, what should happen with these people? Uh, so the first thing, the government decided, the United States government decided, let's send in sharpshooters, men from the Civil War that, that were, you know, um, uh, very good at, with, with targets and, and, and you know, sharpshooting. Uh, travel to the prairie and just follow the huge herds of buffalo and just simply shoot them all dead. Indiscriminately drop them where you see them. Understand that the natives hunted the buffalo and they killed them too. But they'd kill one or two or three maybe depending on the size of the tribe. They would, they would, uh, they would pray about it. It was sacred. And when they killed the buffalo, they would, they would pray over it and thank it for its sacrifice of, of allowing their people to live. But the natives would use every part of a buffalo, from the, from the meat, of course, for food, from the organs to create oils, the bones for tools, 
the, the the horns for scrapers and tools, you know, the hides for blankets and clothing and teepees. By the time a tribe would, you know, finish uh, with the buffalo, there wasn't much of it left. But now here, here are the American sharpshooters are just dropping them wherever they are and leaving them just, you know, on, on just as they were, just, just to rot. And, you know, literally, if you found a buffalo herd, there might be a thousand buffalo and you might have 10 sharp. They just bam, 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 each one just killed them all. So you have the prairies full of dead buffalo. Of course, the natives are shaken at the atrocities of these white people. What is the matter with these people? Why are they doing this, this beautiful animal? Uh, so, you know, again, different points of view completely. This is a poem that kind of, uh, well, I'm sorry, before I go to the poem, let me let me show you a, a, a rather astonishing uh, picture. Talking about the buffalo and, you know, how many were killed and, is there any way to, to, to get a number on that or any way to symbolize what that what that idea was or, or how many buffalo were killed by these sharpshooters? And this image might put into perspective for you. These are buffalo skulls. This is just one part of the prairie. So imagine how many buffalo had to be killed to make that pile. Here you see a man at the bottom. Let's just say he's six feet tall. So that that piles, what, 25 feet tall, you know, 50, 100 feet wide. I mean, imagine the number of buffalo that were killed just in cold blood to take away the Native Americans' food source and their purpose for living, this, the sacred buffalo. That's a way we'll get rid of them. We'll, we'll make them starve, okay? So, I mean, this is not exactly you know, the what you th think would be the actions of a country claiming to be about liberty, justice, equality, freedoms, you know, everyone's got got these abilities and opportunities. Here you're you're indiscriminately just destroying a a herds of animals to take away another human's uh, human's food source. Uh, this is a poem that kind of puts it in perspective. I'm going to read it first and we'll go over it uh, kind of line by line. In a past that is now lost forever, there was a time when the land was sacred, and the ancient ones were as one with it, a time when only the children of the great spirit were here, to light their fires in these places with no boundaries, when the forests were as thick as the fur of a winter bear, when a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo, when the deserts were in bloom and the streams pure as freshly fallen snow. In that time, when there were only simple ways, I saw with my heart the conflicts to come, and whether it was to be good or bad, what was certain was that there would be change. So, of course, in the, in a past that's lost forever, the land was sacred. There wasn't anybody tearing it up. It was all indigenous people with their respect for the land. And the ancient ones were as one with it. They, 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 were, they respected the land and, and lived with it. Uh, at a time when only the children of the great spirit were here, again, only natives were here to light their fires in places with no boundaries, no barbed wire, no private property. Forests as thick as the fur of a winter bear, uh, not chopped down, you know, to plant or, or settle. Um, when a warrior could walk from horizon to horizon on the backs of the buffalo. Well, not literally, but they were that many. They were, they were everywhere. Now they're all gone. Uh, when the streams were pure as freshly fallen snow, not polluted, not fished out. Only simple ways but before the white man came. And I saw with my heart the conflicts to come, whether good or bad, it would be there uh, for certain would be change. Uh, so, of course, you have to ask the question. Uh, the benevolent Christians ordained by God to, to move across the land. Uh, I mean, would God approve of this? Would, would, a, would the Christian God approve of Christians slaughtering animals to starve another people? Uh, it's hard to imagine that, that, that he would be okay with that. This is another image called the coming of the white man. And symbolically, you see that ship that, out there on the horizon. And, of course, they're, they're recoiling in fear and, 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 and concern. Uh, symbolically, that would be Columbus. Of course, Columbus is the, first, is the first one to start the wave of people. So all this is what these indigenous people went through. Uh, 
So understand the history of Native Americans on the lands that became the United States. It's vital and needs to be known and understood to fully grasp the history of the United States. Uh, their story is a very important part of American history. Okay, so the end of the war allowed people to, like I said, revisit westward expansion. You have the Transcontinental Railroad completed in 1869. And of course, that connects east and west coast. It only looks like it's halfway across the country, but by that time on the on the right side of the country, the east side, there are already rails all the way to where this one starts. The Transcontinental Railroad was only ha only was built you know, about halfway across the country, but it connects east and, and west. And uh, of course, you know this this makes it much easier for people to travel. You don't have to be on, in covered wagons for months. Safer, you know, faster uh, transport goods. So of course, cities in the west start to start to pop up because now you have you have ways to get there. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, this idea that we finished the job that Christopher Columbus started. What did Christopher Columbus try to do? He was trying to get to China to get to the exotic uh, goods from, from Asia, including uh, uh, silk and, and spices. Uh, and the exploration period in the, in the world was all about that. So finally, with the Transcontinental Railroad, now you finally have decent access to Asia. You can you can bring goods across by ship to say San Francisco and then put it on a train and ship it all the way to New York City. Uh, so perhaps this this quick way to China was solved here. Uh, OK. Uh, so it, it became clear pretty early, uh, even as we're even as the uh, as the Americans are coming west across their own land, that this this idea of manifest destiny is going to keep going around the world. Uh, Subduing Asia uh, was foremost on the minds of the American government uh, because, again, of this obsession with Asian goods and Chinese goods and, and silk and spice and so on. Uh, so it was believed that the United States had to open relations with the Far East. Uh, so they talked to Japan and would you let us, you know, use your part of your country as a base for us to do our thing trading around the world becoming a world power and japan said no we don't want to have relations with you we don't want to have open relations with the west we don't trust you japan was isolationist so the united states much like the mexican american war decided to force the issue and they showed up in the harbor with you know ships of war uh, and they forced the treaty of kanagawa by military intimidation, and they forced Japan to allow American ships to stop there and refuel there as they were going around the world. Uh, so, so why is this important? Because to be a world power in the, in the mid 19th century, you you have to have access to the world, but you can't just go out and ship and sail around and never stop anywhere. You got to stop and resupply and, and so on. Uh, all, all these ships were, were run by steam engines, and steam requires coal, a lot of it. So you couldn't possibly leave New York City and travel around the world and carry enough coal to do that. You, you've got to replenish your source of coal somewhere, and, and, and more than one place. So, so it's, it's kind of like gas stations, if you think about it that way. When you're driving across the country or long distance, you're on the interstate, you've got to stop and get gas once in a while. The United States or any other world power at that time had to stop and get coal to keep on powering their ships. So that's why they did it. That that was why Japan was important. They saw it as a as a filling station to pick up coal, uh, but 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 also to resupply, uh, repair your ship, give your men a break, and expand your your trade uh, you know um, partnerships with people. Uh, William Seward uh, had been the Secretary of State for Lincoln and, and Johnson also. Uh, he very much encouraged trade. And he wanted to build bases for the United States in Asia and the Caribbean. Uh, he wanted to annex Hawaii. Why Hawaii? Well, the, Hawaii is the perfect stop in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. If you're leaving from the United States, you can stop there and you're, you're you know, 
a little less than halfway to Asia. So you can stop and resupply and then make the rest of the way. Uh, so they want to annex Hawaii, but, but Hawaii doesn't really want to be annexed. They're perfectly happy with what they have and their queen, uh, uh, La, La Leo Kalani, um, was the queen and she didn't want anything to do with annexation. We're happy the way that it was. So the United States annexed it anyway. It wasn't nice. Uh, and this is the story, kind of the star of the story of how, how this island chain went from a sovereign kingdom under a queen to a republic, to a U.S. territory, to a state. Uh, 1893, a coup, coup d'etat, takeover, led by Americans, took over the Hawaiian government. Uh, and this was forcible removal by the United States Marines. Uh, and of course, after they did that, they urged the United States government to annex the islands. So the Marines landed in 1893, took over government buildings, and placed the Queen under house arrest. Uh, two years later, after a failed uh, insurrection, uh, by the Queen's supporters. They tried to return her uh, to her royal royal rule to her, but they were they were unsuccessful. She was charged with treason and again put under house arrest. Uh, in a statement in exchange for a pardon for her and her supporters, and this is a statement, she yielded to the superior force of the United States of America under protest pointing out that John L. Stevens, U.S. Minister to Hawaii, who supported the provisional government, had already caused United States troops to be landed at Honolulu. Now, to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps loss of life, I do, under this protest and impelled by said forces, yield my authority under, until such time as the government of the United States shall, upon the facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representative and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, of course, that, that didn't happen. Um, the, the Queen did, did not get her island back, and it became an American territory, which, of course, today it's a state. Let's go to a film here. Uh, please watch the film entitled uh, Lilio Kalani, Hawaii's Last Queen and tells the story of how Hawaii became a U.S. territory. Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so back to Seward. Seward also promoted a presence in the Philippines and this idea of a Panama Canal. So why, why was this canal so important? Well you, well, you see here this very thin piece of land. You know, if you're going to ship from New York City to San Francisco before the canal, you had to travel all the way around this huge continent of South America and all the way up it would take you 13,000 miles. Okay. If you cut a canal through here, you can then cut through and, and knock off, uh, you know, what is that? 12, uh, 8,000 miles off your trip. Uh, it cuts it in less than half. You just, you just come through here, cut through the canal and you're already there. So of course a huge boom to trade, but but also the military. You you can, you know, if you're at war and, and your fleet's in the Atlantic, but suddenly there's something that you need the fleet for over here in the Pacific, you don't have to go around this entire continent. You cut right through. So the Panama Canal was a huge uh, moment, and of course the the uh, United States wants a presence. They want to control it. Uh, Seward also purchased Alaska from from Russia. And everyone thought, "What are you nuts? It's an it's a it's an ice box. What, what what could possibly be be of value all the way up there, up up by the, you know, uh, the Arctic Circle? I mean, you know, it's it's cold. It's dark year round. This was a waste of, of money. But it turned out to be quite the opposite. It's a land of incredible resources, incredible amounts of gold, timber, furs, uh, and so on. So Alaska was bought very very cheap." And, and uh, the United States is expanding again. Uh, the Berlin Game Seward Treaty of 1868 uh, was, to, was to ease immigration restrictions. Uh, so it was a Chinese effort to limit American interference in internal Chinese affairs, uh, but also allowed for migration 
for Chinese workers for the Transcontinental Railroad. So understand, the, the treaty allowed Chinese to come to be to come to the United States to be a labor force. And they were an integral integral labor force in the California Gold Rush and the Transcontinental Railroad. Two hugely important moments of significance historically in the United States history. They were brought here to do that. But after the railroad was finished and the gold rush was was over, uh, there seemed to be no further need for the Chinese and they were no longer allowed to come to America. In fact, they were excluded from coming at all uh, for any reason by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Initially, it was for 10 years, but it kept getting extended 10 more, 20 more, uh, until finally the extension went for more than 60 years that Chinese people could not come to this country. It wasn't until the middle of World War II, uh, as China was an ally in that war, did they finally get rid of this and allow Chinese to come again. Okay, so so progress and, and you know uh, manifest destiny and modernity and and the modern age and it, and it all comes very very quickly. Railroads, railroads changed everything, opened up the West. You could transport troops, supplies, goods, people, anywhere in a short time. Uh, but lots of corruption with railroads. In fact, I would say railroads created the idea of a corporation, uh, which of course is huge today, right? We, we live in, in a corporate world today. The United States was built on small business, uh, you know, business owners, families, but that's a dying breed today. Corporate America has driven the small business person out of business in many cases. You know, it's just, you just don't have that opportunity anymore. You can't compete with the corp corporations today. So railroads were private enterprises funded and subsidized by the government, uh, open for schemes and fraudulent activities. Uh, we remember the Credit Mobilier from Chapter 15 during Grant's presidency. But most importantly, the railroads linked all points of the United States. Uh, with all this expansion and, and importation of goods and the expansion of trade, you know, you have what's called tariffs or, or, or duty on imports, a tax or duty that a government charges on goods coming into or going out of the country. And the idea is it really is designed to protect the United States worker from being outbid by uh, a foreign, uh, you know, uh, company. So the, the image here is showing how American-made uh, cloth costs four dollars a roll. Uh, so the, the British, it costs the same thing, but they charge a 25 percent tariff. So it costs five dollars a roll for, for British. That's to protect the. American uh, worker, our, our you know business person that's manufacturing cloth, uh, but so tariffs, duties, it also helped to pay for the Civil War. You know the the country was 2.9 billion in debt, and they went from that to a surplus, all because of tariffs and duties on on imports, uh, and it was all about not allowing low wage foreign competition to you know destroy the American business person. But the other side of it is it, it did not allow Americans access to cheap foreign goods. Uh, it helped to transform American corporations and the United States economy into a huge success. But the benefits by the owners of small business were not felt by the workers. They still worked long hours, low pay. Uh, and search, search for low wages is still in effect today. Corporations get around, uh, you know, uh, labor uh, and and minimum wage by farming their labor out to other countries where they can get it very cheap. Uh, so corporations, business, it's always about the bottom line. You, you always want to cut your expenses to make more money. Uh, capitalism is about profit and more profit. And every year you want to make more than the last year. So if you make $100 million last year, you only make ninety nine and a half million this year. You're a failure. I, I can't imagine that you're a failure when you make that kind of money. But from a capitalist point of view, you should have done more. You should have done one hundred and ten million the, the the second year, not go backward. So it it constantly requires the business owner to to cut their expenses, and labor is an easy place to do it. Uh, so you look for cheap foreign labor, 
So, of course, who shops at Walmart? And of course, nobody raises their hand, but we all do at some point or another. And you ask the question, why are their clothes so cheap? It's because the labor was done in a third world country that the people that did it were paid nothing. You know, you, you couldn't have possibly, uh, you know, bought that that piece of clothing from an American company using American labor at $15 an hour. You, you've got to factor that into your price. But if you pay somebody $5 a day to do the same work that people in America are doing for $15 an hour, you can cut your bottom line and sell it cheap and undercut your competition. So this is how they do it. Uh, you set up shop in a new country, you build a factory or a manufacturing plant, and then you put the indigenous people, the people that are there to work, and you pay them extremely low wages that you, that you wouldn't get away with in America. You have, you have laws and rules here, but in another country you can. Uh, so $15 an hour versus maybe $5 a day. Uh, big, big difference, huge difference in, in how much it's costing a company per day. And if you're the owner, and you're looking at that kind of savings, you know, it, it, it's, of course, something that you want to do. But it, but it comes at the expense of people's, you know, lives and, and goodwill and, and ability to make a living. Uh, these people are starving. Uh, but the, the, the company can sell their products cheaper. Uh, uh, but, you know, at the expense of the workers. So, of course, much racial discrimination in this era. These workers in other countries are typically non-white and you're taking advantage of them and you're oppressing them. Uh, and racism is a huge part of, of the story, of this Manifest Destiny story. It, it, it might be the largest part. In the Southwest as well, the federal courts promoted economic development at the expense of racial justice. So nobody was trying to implement equality and and to not be racist they were perfectly fine to to you know uh just outwardly say yes we're doing this because we are racist it, it wasn't something that was looked down upon in those days and I understand we're talking about the southwest here california arizona not the southeast where you had the whole slavery issue this is the southwest but what happened to those mexican people after the war uh, between Mexico and the United States, the Mexican-American War, were they integrated? Were they welcome? If you were living in Arizona for generations, your family, and all of a sudden now you're in the United States, are, are you a United States citizen now? No, you were pushed off your lands. Uh, you were, you were in many cases, starved to death and, and sold into slavery. Uh, thousands were homeless. So discriminations of Mexicans found themselves now living in the United States left thousands of them homeless. Uh, and, you know, American businesses wanted them out. Uh, they want to make money, start industries. And these people were in their way, so pushed off their, their homelands. Uh, of course, yes, it happened to the Native American, the indigenous people, but Mexicans also, because now you're moving into, into as you move west, you're moving to areas that were, that were Mexico. And in its place, the, the uh, Americans come and they start to mine mountains and tear mountains apart. It was very dangerous business. Can you imagine being in a tunnel that small and walking on, your, um, on all fours to pull a, a wagon of coal out or whatever? I mean, the mining's, mining's a tough uh, business. Uh, it also tore up the land. But, you know, America went on the gold standard in this era. And... Uh, that meant that the U.S. backed its currency bills with gold reserves. So you have gold and silver being mined. The Comstock stock load in Nevada was a huge silver strike. Uh, and, you know, miners become kind of iconic of, of America. The American miners, like the cowboy. Uh, so... The indigenous people that treaded lightly in the land were replaced in just a generation by men like these. And I'm not criticizing this person or insulting cowboys or miners. I'm just simply saying that the land changed and the people and their point of view toward the land also changed. The, the, the natives didn't mine anything. They didn't tear it up, but the, the Europeans did. Uh, timber and lumber markets benefited from mining uh, because you have to shore up mines and so they don't collapse. So 
So the, the timber industries in Seattle and Portland grew tremendously. But you also have cattlemen. And we talked about this, you know, the, the natives are gone. And now you're going to have, there, there's, there's no water and weather uh, uh, to, to, to grow crops. The, the West is dry and arid and hot. So instead of crops like the South, you're going to raise cattle and horses. Uh, and you have the, the long drives or the cattle drives. I mean, how, how many bad movies has Hollywood made about cattle drives? But what is a cattle drive? Well, essentially, once the Transcontinental Railroad was, was, was finished, uh, ca cattlemen from Texas, Oklahoma, could drive their cattle north to the railroad and now put their, put their live cattle on the, on the railroad and take them east to Chicago for slaughtering, then sent further on for um, for the end user. Of course, this means that you have a lot less spoilage, a lot less rotted meat. And then, of course, later with re with refrigerated cars, you could slaughter the the cattle and, and then ship it, you know, slaughtered. And but and now it's it's going to be either frozen or stay stay cold enough where it won't, where it won't go back. So a cattle drive, whatever that whole the whole reason was to get your cattle to market. To get your money, and whoever bought it from you is going to put it on a train in, in some capacity. Okay, so again, this all happened very quickly. Uh, the Homestead Act, they, they wanted people to come to the West. How do we get people to come? Uh, the Homestead Act gave 160 acres to people for free. All you got to do is come and claim it, stay on it for five years, and improve the land. If you did that, then it's your land. So, of course, this created a stampede of people, free land. And they came by the droves and populated the land. And as they looked and investigated this, they saw that the lands in the interior were, were labeled as empty. These lands are empty on survey maps. But, of course, that wasn't the case. There were thousands of people living there. Uh, it's just that nobody gave them any credit for, for being worthy of, of a people that were there, the natives. They'd been there for thousands of years. So it's just like Columbus all over again. It's just disrespect and insult. Discovering something that, that people are, are, are living on, right? Uh, did, did the West offer opportunities for African Americans post-Civil War, freed men? And in some cases, yes. The, the exodusters, uh, many uh, African American people fled the southern United States to escape white violence, escape escape oppression, discrimination, escape Jim Crow. Many came to Kansas uh, and to start new lives in, in their continuing efforts to be free. Uh, although many, many uh, freed blacks went to Texas to work in the expanding cotton industry, of course, a job they knew well from when they were slaves. So they, they were they moved and got some freedom, but back in the fields again. Uh, women were a big part of the Westward movement. Uh, the family units came west, and the work of women and children were integral to the success. And, the, and of course, the, the housewife keeping the family together while the family came west. Uh, of course, always trying and pushing for voting rights. Uh, Emily Wells was a Mormon woman. Uh, uh, of, you know, uh, well known for what, what, what her contributions were. She organized a movement that pressured the Utah Territory to allow women to vote. Uh, so Utah and Wyoming actually allowed women to vote long before the 19th Amendment. Uh, Mormon women were involved in plural marriages, polygamy, where, where a man would have, you know, more than one wife, and in some cases more than 20. Um, Emmeline Wells herself lived in what, what's called a plural marriage, one of seven wives. So I mentioned the land was changed by all this quickly, and they didn't think ahead about you know managing the land so we get the so we can maintain it. It 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 it, it was it was just destroyed quickly. Uh, so again, for thousands of years, mostly the land had been serene, untouched by Native Americans, but now in just a generation. Forests cleared, lakes fished out, mountaintops torn apart, all in the name of business and capitalism. And you have this environmental impact, abuse of the land, overuse. It, it turned out that the free 160 acres 
it was really too much land to maintain without water. There's no water source of, of any real, real uh, size. But the settlers came in their defiant arrogance, that American Western expansion person, arrogant. And they felt they could conquer nature. That we'll, we'll be fine. We, we, we will get the land subdued and the wild nature out of it. So perhaps a, you know, overconfident, arrogant kind of boisterous point of view. Can, can you really subdue Mother Nature and, and bring her to, you know, your, your control? P probably not. Uh, as a result of all the destruction of the land, over plowing, uh, you know, uh, ground having the nutrients you know, uh, taken out of it, uh, all the overplowing created an avenue for weeds and destructive insects, bull weevils, erosion, and the land fell apart. And it wasn't the, it wasn't the rich land that it had been. John Wesley Powell, Powell had been a major in the Union Army Civil War, lost an arm at Shiloh. Uh, but was an adventurer and explorer in his own right. Post-Civil War, he explored the Colorado River, and he claimed that, that the large parcels of land that were being, were being given away would not work in the Southwest. There's not enough water. So the, the only way to make it work is the government needed to uh, copy the Mormons, what they were doing in Utah with their successful irrigation projects. But the American government voted him down. So, of course, the... It, it wasn't fixed, and the environment took all of these hits. Uh, so as a result, uh, the government determined to create some, some specific agencies to control these abuses. And the United States Fishery Commission was created in 1889 to control the decline of fish. So, you know, again, the natives would fish and take enough to eat the Americans would 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 want to to get a thousand fish to eat two and sell a thousand nine hundred ninety eight. Okay, I got to eat. But I want to make money. So there be there's no fish left. Uh, so you know we 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 think of eighteen eighty nine as the as the good old days and you know a less complicated time. And it's not always the case. It was complicated then, and and the land was being abused. Uh, so the government decided to put some parcels aside to, to preserve it, especially the very pretty parks. Yellowstone became the first national park. Uh, so, again, America determined that we should save some of the nicer parts from development. Uh, so national parks, such as Yellowstone, were preserves that were set aside. Of course, the Native Americans are bewildered. Uh, I mean, first of all, this was this was an example of of their kind, these white people, uh, who overused, abused, selfish, greedy, arrogant, mostly to make money. Uh, you, they, they had different points of view. You just fish for what you need. You leave the, the rest for someone else. Uh, and the white man destroys the land for all their projects. But then put aside a park so people could remember what unused land looked like. Uh, of course, in the Native Americans' mind, it used to all look like this. You're putting aside this nice parcel, but you're destroying the rest. They, they couldn't understand that. It, it didn't make sense to them at all. How can you do this to this to this you know wonderful Mother Earth? Does anyone know who Joni Mitchell is? Joni Mitchell was an influential singer-songwriter in the '60s and '70s, kind of a counterculture, anti-war you know musician. And she wrote a, a very uh, famous song called Big Yellow Taxi. Uh, and the most famous line in the song is, you paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Uh, this tune came out in the 60s, but the Counting Crows uh, redid it again in 2002. Uh, but but this, this kind of, the, these lyrics say what I'm, what I'm trying to say here uh, of what happened. So here's the lyrics for her song. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They paid paradise and put up a parking lot. They took all the trees and put them in a tree museum. And they charged all the people a dollar and a half to see them. Of course, 1960, it cost you a dollar and a half to go to a museum. Today, it would cost you $50 probably, right? Hey, farmer, farmer, put away that DDT now. Give me spots on my apples, but leave me the birds and bees, please. So DDT was an insecticide that was sprayed on crops that, it, that it has since been, uh, it's prohibited now, it's against the law because it creates cancer. 
uh, spots on my apples you know if you work in a supermarket today and you go to the produce department you don't see spots on apples you, every piece of fruit is perfect and if it's not the produce manager throws it away the 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 amount of produce being thrown away in a supermarket could feed you know uh, many many people boxes and boxes and boxes of perfect perfectly good produce is thrown away because it doesn't look perfect you know in the 60s and 70s you, you would eat apples with spots on it, it, was, it it's an apple it, it wasn't perfect but today we, we have to have perfect okay so this is kind of the way the Native Americans felt uh, about these these American settlers coming west uh, and they were embarrassed and, and hurt by their approach to the land uh, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce tribe uh, he makes a pretty famous uh, comment here Americans were not settling an empty West they were unsettling it by taking it from the native peoples who already lived there and destroying it uh, so so is anyone surprised by all this what you've learned here is is this different from what you thought or what you were taught you know are are we being anti-american by by saying all this I mean is it is it anti-american to tell the truth uh, these aren't rumors there, there's there's much scholarship to back up all of this as a as a history professor I, I can't just you know talk about things that haven't been uh, you know proven to, to, to be uh, you know, the, the truth that's that's what I try to do here uh, so I'm not in I'm not trying to be anti-american um, by any means it's just again sometimes teaching what really happened versus the sanitized whitewashed version can make us feel it's a little depressing almost to think of, of this of this country that we've all always been taught was the best ever actually behave this way uh, I mean you know America's proven to be a great country regardless of what anyone says including me that's a given but but truth is what creates change and and are, are we in need of change in this country today and I think anybody would say of course we are we, and we always will be that's the beauty of a free country Okay, so continuing with this with this theme of of this of this conflict between the uh, these two cultures, white settlers and Native Americans, indigenous people, let's do a supplemental lecture right here, number two. So we've done one before. I kind of went over it briefly. What I'm looking for, of course, you can always go to the uh, modules where I have the uh, instructions there. You can go to always go to week one, find the instructions there, video tutorials and written instructions. So please make sure you understand what's going on here with with supplemental lectures. You're doing a review of the lecture, the supplemental lecture itself, not the entire lecture, just between when I say let's start a supplemental lecture to the end. You're taking that information and writing a review and essay about it. OK. OK. If you have questions about that, let me know early as opposed to later in the semester. Um, so clash of cultures let's look at our outline number one introduction what was the English point of view about natives number two the Great Plains the change in the land and what was the racist slogan number three Max Weber not Weber Weber and his Protestant work ethic and the details to that number four what was the results uh, neither side could could compromise or integrate themselves and as always at the end is the relevance okay let's get started okay so as the Western movement began and expanded uh, why couldn't they come together and compromise uh, you know these these settlers these American settlers were were self self-proclaimed uh, benevolent Christians not not exactly the Spanish conquistadors the conquistadors said we're coming here to conquer you but but these are God-fearing Christians, benevolent. Uh, why? Did, why was there such a conflict, and why was it so ugly, and why was there so much bloodshed? And it and it truly is because it was a clash of two very different cultures. And I've talked a little bit about it already. It was impossible for the two to come together and compromise because of their vast differences. The English despised the Native Americans from the very beginning, since the early colonial days. In fact, the first occurrence of biological warfare in American history took place in the French and Indian War when the English offered the Native Americans a gift of blankets. And of course, the, the, the Natives were surprised and distrustful 
You know, why would they do that? They hate us. Why would they be giving us blankets? Well, it turned out that the blankets had been infected with smallpox, and they're trying to create genocide and have them all die. Uh, so they, so they knew this. They, they don't like, they don't like us. So two very different people with very different approaches to life uh, came into conflict with each other. So going back to this idea of the land, you know, the Great Plains. You, when you think of it, you know, I, you know, I idealistically you think of this. No trees, no shrubs, uh, arid, dry, but you know, kind of rolling flat plains, and buffalo. This is what this is what the ideal, uh, you know, idea in in your head is of what the Great Plains is. But is that what it really looks like? Is that what the Great Plains looks like today? So when I talked about the Europeans came, the American shuttles and changed the land quickly. This is what I mean. If you fly across the Great Plains today and look down, and I've done this many times, it's like a checkerboard. It's pieces of property that someone's growing this on, someone's growing on something else over here. It's it's independent farms, and I'm I'm not insulting independent farmers in the Great Plains. Don't misunderstand me. The the, the farmers in the Great Plains create a tremendous amount of food that, that feeds the world. I, I'm not trying to insult or criticize. I'm just pointing out how the land changed okay it went from it went from this to that pretty quickly so again an example of of the differences between these two cultures one saw it completely saw the land completely different than the than the other uh, okay so as the as the uh, as the uh, settlers came uh, the uh, the Great Plains on on the on the west side of the Mississippi originally had been set aside for the Indians. Trail of Tears, where they forced the natives out of the southeast, across the Mississippi, Oklahoma, that's your land now. But but then the opportunities in the West proved too much for the American government to stay away from. So they broke their promise again and crossed the Mississippi and wanted to, you know, come and, and take advantage of whatever opportunities they were. So they came and they tore up the land. Um, what do you do with the Native Americans that are that are there that you that you've already removed once? You you try to Americanize them, uh, and what does that mean? Uh, the idea was was developed to assimilate them, to civilize them, to Americanize them, uh, to make them like Europeans. Take away their their native ways, take away their customs, take away their language, take away their religion. Uh, the idea was to do all this. You want to kill the Indian, but save the man. Okay. Uh, so that's our racist slogan from the outline. So of course that's you know extreme example of ethnocentrism. Our our way is the best way. Your your way is not. You need to become like us. But it it destroyed the native people's traditional life ways and forced them to change. Uh, of course they didn't have any choice because they're all dying from disease. So you have these, you have this problem. One culture was very laid back, let the world come to them, and they responded to it. But the other was about getting ahead and and gaining riches. Uh, so most of these Americans moving west, this western expansion, most had come from the eastern United States. Many were from the northeast, where in the past, 16th, 17th centuries, 100, 200 years earlier. There, there had been a strong Puritan presence, and the Puritans developed this deeply entrenched work ethic, uh, and their work ethic became the measure of the Puritan man. A Puritan man has to work hard, work you know day and night, and and don't take vacations. Work 12, 14 hours a day. Get ahead, get ahead. You've got to keep working to prove that you're worthy. Okay. Uh, and this idea of the Protestant work ethic was born. Uh, the noted sociologist Max Weber creates an argument about this, about this work ethic. So understand that Max Weber's not a Puritan. Max Weber was around 200 years later. Max Weber's just a sociologist, or we could call him an historian, looking back on the past and making a judgment about it and coming up with an argument about this about this Protestant work ethic and, and the development of this work ethic. So according to, to Weber, in his book, The Protestant Work Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, uh, 
Now, don't be don't be confused by the word Protestant. Puritans were Protestants. E e either one's interchangeable. Uh, Protestants and Puritans were both protesting the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so, so the Puritans believed that, that God had a plan for all people. And this is called predestination. By, by predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. So predestination was a belief of the Puritans that God had already made a plan for everybody. And some would come to heaven and some wouldn't. But, of course, nobody knew if they were one of the chosen few. Uh, God had a plan for all people, and a certain group of them, called the elect, were predestined to reside in heaven after their life was completed. So, according to Weber, the doctrine of predestination was the dogmatic background of the Puritan morality in the sense of methodically rationalized ethical conduct. A person began to believe that we have to live ascetic lives and be ethical to prove that we're we are one of the of, of God's chosen elect because nobody knew of course if you don't know then of course you're, you're you go crazy trying to figure out am I one of them or not uh, a person could only speculate as to their destiny so this perplexed people uh, these peers and they became worried and frustrated you know how do we know if we're a member of the elect so the people began to believe if they pursued a virtuous life that included a life of hard work, honesty, frugality, avoidance of indulgence, that that would surely prove that they must be included as one of God's chosen people who would live for eternity with God in heaven. So this idea became the cornerstone of Puritan life and working hard and being successful in business became a popular vehicle to gain the favor of God. Uh, so by working hard, it would also increase one's chances for joining the fabled elect. It would also give the impression to one's community that they must be predestined uh, and will be saved by God. Look at them, and they become examples. So everybody, of course, you know, copies them like well let's be like them because they must they, they must be one of the elect if we work like them we will be too uh we must be predestined so this idea became important and hard work became a definitive of the puritan community it became ingrained in all the puritan people this principle became a standard of puritan life and was used as an example to encourage others to work hard in their lives as a method to please God. So back to back to Max Weber, our historian from 200 years later, he's looking back at all this and, and making an argument, make, coming up with a point of view. Uh, Weber called this obsession with the, of working hard to prove that you're predestined, he called this way of life the Protestant work ethic or the Puritan work ethic, either one as the title of his book suggests. Uh, so he's using the Puritans as an example. Uh, so over the years, you know, the Puritans have faded from history. They're, 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 no, they're, they're no longer a relevant people with a relevant religion much anymore. There's offshoots of it, but the original Puritan people are gone for the most part. Uh, but their work ethic is still here. It, it, insp it inspired and influenced everybody especially in the Northeast, not so much the South, but the Northeast, and everybody took on this we-have-to-work-hard point of view. Americans today, you can be an atheist, but you still have that drive to work hard. Americans bypass vacations to, to keep on working. Uh, if, can, I, can, I, can I just get vacation pay and pay me for the week and I get double pay? I'd rather do that than go on vacation. You know, in, in, in Europe, they go on, on holiday for a month. In, in Mexico, they have siestas during the day, but Americans work hard, 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 nose to the grindstone all the time. So even though it's got nothing to do with Puritans anymore, typical American culture is about working hard. And Weber suggested it came from this idea of uh, working hard to prove to God that you are, are worthy. This became part of the fabric of American life and ideals then and now. Uh, the value perme permeating into, into everyday American life. 
and continued long after the days of the Puritans. Hard work with tenacity became part of the American character, even in this very day. So this, this helps explain why the Americans were driven so hard to gain and excel. It was ingrained in their culture. So they saw this they saw these lands that, that no one's taking advantage of and they their eyes got wide, oh my gosh, we're gonna we're gonna do very well here. Uh, but of course the natives are there saying, What are you talking about? We don't understand what you mean. So you have this clash of these two cultures, two very different cultures with very different goals. And they faced each other in the western westward expansion era. Uh, and neither could they, neither side could compromise or in, or integrate with each other. You know, the the white people saw the natives as lazy and un uncommitted to growth and progress. All this opportunity, and you're not taking advantage of it. This went against their ingrained work ethic. Uh, so by this point, again, you don't have to be a, a Puritan to have this work ethic. It became part of American life. Americans saw the land as as a land of endless opportunity that was motivated by business and profit making money. Uh, the natives didn't see it that way at all. They didn't understand. What do you mean about making money and profit? We're, we're here to live off the land and be serene with it. Uh, so, here, so here are the American settlers still implementing this philosophy from long ago, this long ago Puritan era 200 years earlier of working hard to please God. This, of course, is the opposite of the native ways, and this is why they weren't able to integrate with each other. Okay, to end supplemental lecture number two, clash of two cultures, here is the relevance, okay? The Europeans, this is, this is rather long, I'm sorry. The Europeans felt the Native Americans were not ambitious because they were not taking advantage of opportunities. They felt they were lazy. This went against their work ethic that started with the Protestant work ethic that has permeated into everyday American society from the Puritan days and their fear of predestination or not being a member of God's elect. Whew, long one. One more time, relevance. The Europeans felt the Native Americans were not ambitious because they were not taking advantage of opportunities. They felt they were lazy. This went against their work ethic that started with the Protestant work ethic that is permeating into, into everyday American society from the Puritan days and their fear of predestination or not being a member of God's elect. Okay, so that is the official end of supplemental lecture number two. So don't forget, you're only taking information from the start to the finish and nowhere else in the lecture, the book, the internet, nowhere else, just the lecture itself, okay? Okay, that is also the end of uh, part one for chapter 16. Uh, please go on to part two. Thank you.